Germans call it liquid bread. In Africa, it is brewed from sorghum and millet. Slavic people call it kvass and make it from rye. And in the Western European tradition, barley and wheat are the main ingredients. Of course, what I'm talking about is beer. No one knows exactly when beer was invented, but we do know that the first beer was enjoyed far back in time. An early quote from those days said that the drink had a side effect of making you feel exhilarated, wonderful and blissful. The process of making beer is simple, and anyone can make beer for themselves at home. In this video, you will see how you can be enjoying your own beer in as little as a month. <laughs> Brian Vandermark, home brewer, goes through six steps when making a large batch of beer. First, he needs to collect the equipment to get ready. Next, he will culture a large amount of yeast overnight. After this, the mash will be prepared, and then the boil, which is a good time for a beer tasting, and finally, the fermentation. To make 10 gallons of chocolate stout, we need a large pot, a propane burner, and a special filter and cooling apparatus. Of course, we also need a few spoons, a smaller pot and heavy-duty thermometer, sanitized plastic tubing for transporting the liquids, a large fermenter, the fermentation locks to keep bacteria from contaminating the beer, and a place to store the batch while it ferments. A home brewer's recipe will change over time as it is perfected. For this brew, Brian is using 20 pounds of English pale malt as the base for his stout. To this he has added one pound of flaked barley for body. For flavor, he is using three types of crystal malts, two pounds of light, a half pound of medium, and a half pound of dark crystal malt. Cocoa powder, a half pound, is used for flavor, along with a pound and a half of chocolate malt. This bag of crushed malt was purchased at a local brew store. The pale malt is crushed at the store into a mixture of flour and grain husks. The grain husks provide a natural filter at the end of the mash for extracting a clear liquid free of particles. It's like breakfast. This is Irish moss. It's actually a, a, a type of dried seaweed. These are little particles of crushed dried seaweed. And you add this to the boil at the beginning. And the, the purpose of this is a clarifying agent. Calcium carbonate, also known as chalk, is used to reduce the acidity of the mash. Calcium sulfate, also known as gypsum, is used to increase the acidity of the mash if the acidity is too low for the enzymes to do their job. I use litmus strips with an indicator that tells us the pH of the mash. Here is the color range I need for a proper mash. If the mash is too acidic, I will get yellowish colors in the output and then I can add calcium carbonate to adjust the pH into the proper range. Here is a nylon filter bag which I use later during the boil as a giant tea bag. Hops plugs are pre-weighed half ounce measures of fresh pressed hops flowers. For simplicity, I use half ounce increments of hops in my recipes. This way I can simply count the number of plugs I am adding to know the exact weight to fulfill the recipe of the beer. They have very strong floral, herbal, and sometimes citrusy aromas. I use fresh spring water in my recipes because tap water has too many impurities. I will add a pre-calculated amount of fresh spring water to the mash tun and then heat it to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. We have 
worship yeast. Beer is yeast, yeast is beer. Now the first thing we're going to do here is we are going to prepare a mini brew. But this work we're making, this whole process is very similar to what we're going to do tomorrow. We're basically you're just boiling, boiling some malt liquid, adding some, some diammonium phosphate so that it'll sterilize, and then we're going to be pouring it into fermenters. And these are our fermenters. They're essentially the same design. It's a sealed jar with an airlock at the top that keeps microorganisms from being able to get inside while allowing gas that's being produced by the living organisms in it's inside to escape. I monitor the temperature of the water as it's heating so that I can add the malt extract at the right time. The powdered malt extract I will use for the culture wort is similar to the wort that I will be producing tomorrow. Some brewers use extract throughout the production of their beer instead of brewing with grains, but this means that they have less control and less fun. Well, I'm going to add this before the boil is achieved, but while the liquid is fairly hot. almost like it's like cotton candy. Sweet. If we add this small amount of yeast to the beer, it's so small that other organisms that fall into the tank will have a chance of competing with the yeast. So what we're doing is we're going to be culturing up the population of the yeast and change this amount of yeast into an amount like this big uh, by growing it in these bottles overnight. Uh, by the time that the main brew is, is ready uh, for yeast, we'll be adding these bottles to that tank and the population of yeast will be far greater than this, probably 10 times this amount. I see, so I see a rolling boil starting and you can see the foamy layer here on the top and I'm just sort of stirring back into the beer. Here, I add the diammonium phosphate to the boiling liquid which dissolves it completely. Here, I put the sterile pot into a cold water bath in the sink. This will cool the liquid quickly in preparation for pouring it into the glass bottles. I want to warm up these bottles so that there's no chance that they'll crack because that, that water might be still pretty warm. I like this bottle a lot better than when it had milk in it. I give the yeast culture a good shake to wake it up and homogenize the chunks throughout the liquid so that I can divide it evenly between the culture bottles. Now it's as simple as cracking this and cracking those things. This. Now that the temperature of the fridge is cold enough that it should deactivate the ale yeast. The ale yeast will remain dormant there until I'm ready to use it. 
This one will be used for the brew tomorrow. So what I, I'm going to put this up on the fridge where it's nice and warm all the time, fairly consistent, and this should come to life in the next few hours and start effervescing like a beer you've just opened. And uh, the, you'll, the yeast sediment layer will form at the bottom and, and, and fill up maybe that much by the time we're ready to start the brew, I would guess. But you know, the population is definitely going up from, right from here on out. Copper filter that I assemble from small parts and install into the mash tun each time I brew. The manifold is held in place by its tight fit in the circular tank. Once the tank is filled with the proper amount of water, I fire up the propane burner and watch the temperature closely. The target temperature is 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the target temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit is achieved, I pour the pale malt and unmalted flaked barley into the tank. I turn off the open flame before I do this because the flour dust is highly flammable, especially in dry conditions. It begins to dissolve into the water and after a few minutes will resemble cooked oatmeal. I must stir the dry flour into the liquid, breaking up chunks as I stir so that it dissolves completely. This of course is best done with a proper tool not just any spoon is appropriate for this. I need a real spoon. A lot of care goes into breaking up all of the chunks of dry flour so that every bit is wetted. This is important for the enzymes to have access to all of the starch and it is important for achieving the proper pH. For the correct pH balance, you need to have the correct proportion of water to malt, which is 1.35 quarts of water per pound of malt. at 150 degrees Fahrenheit, I am ready to add the specialty malts. This includes the darkly roasted chocolate malts and crystal malts that are crushed and mixed together in a separate bag at the store. These malts will then darken and further sweeten the mash. Near the end of the mash, I heat 5 gallons of sparge water to 170 degrees Fahrenheit for use during the filtering. Sparge is the process of extracting the wort from the mash. At first, the wort will run with many grain particles in it. After a minute or so, the particles in the mash will get stuck in the filter, making the wort run clear. Once it is clear, I pour the cloudy wort back into the tank to be refiltered. You will notice that the wort will still have some particles, but this is unavoidable at this stage. The filter will run much slower here, so to retain a pressure head in the tank, I add sparge water to the top. This also helps flush out as much sugar as possible. The sparge works using simple gravity and a siphon. The sparge takes a long time and patience, but if done properly, will produce a clean wort for the boil.
Once the sparge is complete, I put aside the buckets of hot wort and I replace the mash tun with the empty boiler. The boiler is identical to the mash tun, but there is no copper manifold installed. Next, I pour the buckets of hot wort into the boiler. The temperature has dropped significantly during the long sparge, and so it will take some time to heat the liquid to a boil. After pouring all of the wort into the tank, I top it off with more spring water to bring the volume to about 12 gallons. This will be necessary for achieving 10 gallons of beer at the end of fermentation. I fire up the burner again and the wort is on its way to boiling. While the wort is heating up, we carry the heavy mash tun containing the spent grains to the garden for composting. This is a two-person job. The grains are dumped into a growing pile where they will rot and turn into rich soil that I spread throughout the garden. As you can see, this soil makes our garden very lush and healthy. I spray out the tank to clean the remaining grains. Then I break down the manifold and spray the parts clean. The small parts make it easy to clean the entire manifold quickly with a hose. The parts are put away to dry for the next brew. A lot of magic and worship goes into every brew I make. The complexity of the process leaves much to chance, and so proper respect must be paid to the divine for a great tasting beer. Johnny Cash is on a train. And he's never coming back. Johnny Cash, Johnny Cash, he don't smoke hash. Johnny Cash is on the train, he's on the line on the track. Johnny Cash is on the train, and he's never coming back. Once the boil begins, I will add the bittering hops. But first I must skim the growing foam head off the beer to prevent it from exploding. That's chocolate stout, all right. <laughs> While the beer is boiling, I always like to sample some of the finest beers in the world. This part is fun, and I like to include friends in on the tasting. Today, I've chosen a sampling of many beers of different styles. Nothing is more beautiful than a nicely arranged tasting with many colors and aromas. I love beer. ready to set up the wort chiller. This copper coil will be used to cool the beer in the tank quickly after the boil is complete. I install it 15 minutes from the end of the boil to sterilize the outside of the copper and keep the boil pure. You should always connect the garden hoses before putting the wort chiller into the boiler. Here, I put the wort chiller in first and as a result I burn my hand a bit. Ouch! This is the time to add the final hops. This bag contains flavoring hops and is added right after the wort chiller is installed. The wort chiller is a complex contraption with 
one garden hose connected to a cold tap water faucet and the other running into the kitchen sink. You just ain't got nothing to say. I let the water run for about 20 minutes until the tank itself is cool to the touch at the bottom. Awaiting the cool wart just down the stairs is the sterilized fermenter. Now I transfer the chilled wort into the sterile fermenter using a sterile polyurethane tube. I'm careful not to turn the tube's end up until the very last second so that microbes in the air won't fall into it. I connect one end of the tube to the spigot on the boiler and secure it with a screwdriver. One quick action, I remove the airlock from the tank, insert the other end of the transfer tube, and cover the gap with a sterilized piece of plastic torn from a shopping bag. When the spigot is turned, the transfer of the chilled wort from boiler to fermenter begins. After the transfer is complete, I cap the tank and then begin the cleanup. Dump the spent hops into the compost heap. This will also make for good soil. Then I dump the bottom half gallon of the wort containing many unwanted particles into the compost heap. At this point, I take a break to ask the gods for a clean and delicious beer. Well, then rolling green hills are calling me away. The big green hills are calling me away. Every time the city gets too much to bear, the big green hills are calling me away. And the smoky mountains are calling me away. The smoky mountains are calling me away. Every time the city gets too much into its resting place for the next few weeks. I ferment my beer on the kitchen table where there is a fairly constant room temperature. The final step on brewing day is to inoculate the tank with a culture bottle I prepared the day before. The yeast will continue to grow in the tank and eventually turn the wort into a delicious and alcoholic elixir. And so Brian's beer brewing day is complete. Now the beer is on its way to greatness. The hardest task is over. In the next month, the new beer will undergo a miraculous transformation from sweet wort to finished beer.